uh, church with that, I'm going to ask you to stand and open your Bibles and or look to the screens. Oh, by the way, while you're standing, and I just said look to the screens or your Bible, uh, that just reminded me of uh, an amazing interview I heard this weekend, uh, which I was first, I first heard this from Bill Federer. And he said, um, I, he said, I publish my own books so I can keep the rights to my books and keep my books out there. I go, what do you mean? And he said, oh, Amazon's buying books from publishers, historical books, modern day books, it doesn't matter. Amazon's buying, they're paying the, pub, the, the author off or the publishers off. Just, just say your price. Well, whatever. They pay the price, then they take the rights to the book, and either they make money because they believe in it, or they bury the book, and you'll never see it again. So Bill Federer said, I'm going to keep, <laughs> I've worked hard to write my books, I'm going to keep my books, and I just heard this weekend where um, the guy that was being interviewed, I forget what program it was, the guy said, people need to hang on to their physical books, and... They need to buy physical books as soon as they can because they said very soon they're not going to have physical book, physical book stores, and that's when they alter what is in the books. So listen, I said stand and open your Bible or look to the screen. How about this? Make sure that when you come to church that you own a Bible and you carry a Bible. Don't be ashamed. Carry the Bible. Take it to church, but have a physical Bible. In your home, before they start buying up some of these publishers and changing the word of God. Because when, once it's digitized, you don't know what. Isn't it amazing? I thought, when I first heard that, I thought, that's more valuable to me than gold. Think about that. Wow. So, yes, you can read the Bible verse on the screen. while you're holding your Bible. <laughs> I'll read the odd-numbered verses if you'll join together reading the even. This is our last installment. This is our third discussion regarding signs of the coming Antichrist. Why would we care? Why does it matter? All of a sudden, our world has thrust that topic in front of us. So let's respond. The Bible answers everything for us. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and... Are gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble. Listen to this. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the fallen away comes first. The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? For the mystery of lawlessness is already working. It is happening now. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. That's going to be a great day. The coming of the lawless one, or we call him the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous and for this reason, God, notice this, this is the damnation, or this is their judgment. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Father, we pray that you would illuminate your word to our lives. We pray, Father God, that as we dive into this deep stuff, really, 
There's a, sadly, there's a good chance that very few churches, if any, across this nation right now would be taking on this topic and these portions of Scripture before us. But God, we pray that you'd make us a people ready. This is not a message that is uh, going to pack in the people. It's not a message that's going to make anybody feel good. But it sure is a message that gets us ready. It's a message that gets us thinking. It certainly is a message that makes disciples. And that's what you've called us to be. So Father, even if right now there's somebody joining us by whatever means they're viewing, or those that are here right now that may not know you, that Father God, that you would make all this clear to them. Only you can do that. Because, Father, the truth is, all of this, I remember when I first heard this in reading the Bible, it was such a mystery until you unlocked it. And Holy Spirit, we pray that your presence would be here today by unlocking to us your word. For we are your people, and we celebrate that fact in Jesus' name and all God's people said... Amen. Amen. You can be seated, church. And we're looking at signs of the coming Antichrist. Why would we do that when the Bible is pretty explicit, pretty clear regarding the events that surround who this character is? For the last two weeks, we've been building on who and what this individual is all about. According to the Bible, it's an actual human being. According to the Bible, uh, he will arise out of what is... The revived Roman Empire. And the reason why we believe that is because the Roman Empire, both the western and eastern flanks of the Roman Empire, were never officially conquered. In spirit, as it were, the Roman Empire still exists. It's quite interesting to think about that. In fact, so much so that the book of Daniel tells us, as the book of Revelation speaks to us, that in the last days that out of that ancient kingdom will arise 10 toes, and the 10 toes on this statue, this image, where Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel was given that picture, and he didn't understand what it was. He had this vision, and it freaked him out. And so the Bible tells us that he gathered together all of his mad, uh, magicians and soothsayers and, and wise guys, and said, um, I want you to tell me uh, the meaning of, of the dream I had. And they said, tell us about the dream, and we'll tell you the meaning. And Nebuchadnezzar, he was smart. He said, no, wait, you guys are the guys I pay you. You're supposed to be in touch with the gods. I had a dream. Tell me what my dream was, and then tell me its meaning. And they said, King, come on, with all due respect, no despot, no ruler has ever had the guts to ask of such a thing. Again, tell us what you saw, we'll tell you what it means. And he said, if I tell you what I saw, you will make up its meaning. Smart guy, shrewd dude, right? And so they couldn't do it. So he said, that's it. All of you guys are all going to be beheaded. Your houses are going to be burned. Uh, I'm done, and you're, you're off payroll. You are, <laughs> take it up with HR because your head's coming off. <laughs> and um, word got to Daniel, Danana, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You know them as Daniel, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they said, what, uh, Daniel said, what's the deal? What, what's, what's, uh, what's going on? The king's ordered all you smart guys to be put to death because nobody can, Tell him what, he, what dream he had, and it really troubled him. And uh, Daniel said, give us, give us some time, me and the, my buddies. Our God knows. And Ariok said, okay, listen, I'll stall. And Daniel went to prayer and fasting with, the, with his three brothers. The four of them got together. They sought God. God spoke and gave them the dream and the interpretation of the dream. By the way, you may be sitting here thinking, this is just Bible. I'm actually telling you about world history, Amen. secular world history. So God told, God showed and told Daniel the, the meaning. And so time came to kill them all, and Daniel said, take, take, me, take me to the king. He goes to the king and says, king, 
You are the head of gold, the Babylonian Empire. You are the sole ruler of the world. An inferior kingdom is going to rise when your kingdom leaves. And it will be powerful, but not as powerful in its authority. And that will be the Medo-Persian Empire. And that, that is of the shoulders and of the, of the torso. And then there's going to be uh, one with the, with the lower part of the torso that's going to come after that one. And that's going to be the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great. That guy's going to come hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years from now. And after him, his kingdom's going to be defeated by a, a, a kingdom that is just brutal in its force. It is going to bludgeon people into submission. And that is going to be the Roman Empire. And in the days of that Roman Empire, that it will maintain down to the level of ten toes. But there will be ten toes, as it were, iron mixed with clay. And it's very interesting. Daniel chapter 2 says, And they shall mingle with the seed of men. It's a very eerie statement. Whoever they are suggests perhaps fallen angelic beings will seek to intermingle with man in this world during the reign of the ten toes. We studied a few weeks ago that they were also known as the ten horns in the book of Revelation as well. What are we talking about? We are talking about the last governing world empire before Christ returns. And the Bible says that there's indicators as to what that will be, what it will look like, how it comes into power. And so out of this world of turmoil, the Bible says there's going to be a, a precondition to the advent of this Antichrist individual. There'll, there'll be a world in peril. There'll be a world in upheaval. There'll be a world in economic collapse. There'll be a world at war. It will be a world of panic. And uh, it's all centered, by the way, around the nation of Israel. And it appears, the Bible says in Daniel 9, that he will come on the scene. And it says in Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27, that he'll have a peace treaty with the nation of Israel for seven years. A seven-year peace treaty. Isn't that amazing I'm talking about that? That's 2,600-year-old prophecy. And that's the issue today. Somebody trying to get a peace treaty with Israel and its neighbors. That's always been the case. Every president since the rebirth of the nation of Israel has had to embroil himself in trying to figure out, what do we do with Israel? Well, the Bible says this one's going to come from the ancient Roman world and he's going to have all the answers. We call him the Antichrist, the son of perdition. He goes by all kinds of names and we covered those names. But you, you might say, as we've been stressing before, why would we learn about him if I understand the Bible right? Well, for this reason. According to the passage of scripture you just read a moment ago, that wicked one, that antichrist, cannot be revealed until the church is removed from the earth. And that's very clear in scripture. But listen, you want to be careful that you let the Bible speak to you from the Bible. You don't want people to tell you what the Bible says. Let the Bible tell you what it says. So a lot of people in these last two weeks, boy, some of you have got, you're all lathered up. I believe I'm going to go through the tribulation. Well, knock yourself out, brother. Go for it then. Well, I think I'm in the middle point of it. I think it's going to be all great and fine for the first three and a half years. And then when it gets bad, I'm going to, I'm going to go up. Well, you know what? I don't know where you got that from. But I can tell you this. You got that from somebody, not the Bible. Because mark it down, we don't have time to dive into it, just research it if you care. The seven remaining years, known as the seven year tribulation period, is specifically God dealing with the nation of Israel, not the church. The church will be complete in what God is doing with it. That's why we read, and we'll look at it again, that's why you read 2 Thessalonians 2, but in our final installment today, I trust, it, I pray, it will be uh, more clear as well. Write this down at the top, though, if you would. Why should we care? Number one, Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Never, never let this go from your memory. In fact, when I sign emails or letters, um, this is what I sign beneath my name. Titus 2, 13. 
looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, looking for, that's in the act of now, looking, looking. The believer, the believer who loves the Lord Jesus Christ is actively looking for the blessed hope. What's the blessed hope? What's another word for blessed, by the way? Anybody know? Simple. Happy. Happy hope. Looking for the happy hope, the blessed hope, wonderful hope, and glorious appearing of our great God. Boy, any doubt regarding the deity of Jesus is gone with this one verse. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a powerful statement that is. That should be number one in all of your doings of your life. Getting up tomorrow, tomorrow's Monday. Are you going to go to work? I'm not. I have tomorrow off. Monday's my day off. I'm going to be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearance. Listen, this is second service. Still got third service to go. I'm looking for the blessed hope right now. He could come at any time. And we'll talk about that today. But we're asking a question. And we've got a message titled, The Signs of the Coming Antichrist. And this is why we're talking about it. Because if we're looking around the world right now and starting to see indicators of a one-world government, a one-world economy, a one-world citizenship, a one-world union, which is all laid out in the Bible, you would suppose that we're starting to hear about such things in the world around us, and lo and behold, that's exactly what's going on. I hope this is the last time you see his face. I'm tired of seeing his face. I don't want to see his face anymore. Well, the part that I can't figure out is why does he look still so grumpy? <laughs> Mr. Grumpy Pants, Klaus Schwab. This guy, do you know, do you know that this guy is an unelected, unelected nobody who invented back in 1971 a little club? Him, himself, and himself were in the club. He called it the World Economic Forum. And he started inviting people to hear him talk. And uh, now, do you know that no global leader in the world does anything each year without first going to Davos, Switzerland, to gather with all the corporate elites of the world? And they all leave that meeting, and they all say after the meeting the exact same things all around the globe. Doesn't matter what country it is, they repeat it's like Klaus Schwab pulls the string, and they all say it. There's only one guy, by the way, you should look at the pictures. There's only one guy that went there and just blew it all up. And he just didn't, he, it was kind of fun. I'm not going to mention his name. He just, didn't, he just didn't play according to the rules. And uh, maybe that's why he still looks the way that he does. But the, this guy says something, and they do it. This guy says, we need to stop... Uh, Cattle farming and dairy farming because the, the flatulence from cattle and cows is rowing the CO2 in, in the air. Did you know that? You know where that came from? This guy. This guy ruined the dairy industry, by the way, in San Bernardino County way back when. Remarkable. All of these things that you hear about. Say, well, who cares what he thinks? I don't, but the world leaders do. Why is that the case? Why is there a push to create now a global currency? And we just learned this week that Japan, I've lost count. Japan now is the, the, the next nation to divorce themselves from the U.S. dollar. Does anybody know what number we're at this morning as of Sunday morning? I, lo I stopped counting at nine. I lost track at nine nations, which spells certain doom for the United States economy regarding the oil among many other things. But what's the big push? You're going to hear more and more about digitizing a currency, a numeric currency. And the Bible tells us that one of the indicators of the coming of this man will be the fact that in Revelation 13, he is going to implement a number system for you and I, I say you and I, for those in, on the world, in the world scene, to purchase and to sell by numbers only. No cash, no money, no currencies. Gone. So I'm, listen, be 
listening then, the Bible speaks of a cashless society. Ask yourself if you are hearing and watching the news regarding cashless societies. It's growing more and more, and you're going to watch it. It's going to really, really pick up steam this summer, more and more. Cashless transactions. Cash will no longer, or soon, will no longer be welcomed. Why? Because the Bible speaks that's the direction we're going, among many other things. It's just impossible for us to cover them all. But I want you to know two things today that is extremely, extremely vital. Go back in your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians 2. We read them read it a moment ago, and um, get out your highlighter or your pen and mark this down. I did not anticipate the, the amount of confusion that some people have regarding this, and that's sad, but let's fix it now. God didn't give us the Bible to confuse us. He gave the Bible to us for us to know. Now, brethren, concerning, verse 1, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. That's the rapture. I'll prove it in a minute. We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Do you remember I told you last week that this letter of 2 Thessalonians was written to them because they had been told that after, after Paul left in his first visit in his first letter that they had missed the rapture. People came later and said, you're in the tribulation period. And they said, wait a minute, Paul said we weren't going to be in it. Uh, he didn't know what he was talking about. So they're upset, so he writes them saying, what are you upset about? It hasn't happened. It hasn't started. Didn't I tell you? And he begins to reiterate the hope of Christ returning for the church because, listen, the church is very, very distinctly different from the nation of Israel. If, listen, this is a huge teaching that's going around the world today and it's false doctrine and heresy that Israel is no more and in your Bible where it says Israel, insert the church. That is called replacement theology and it's from Satan. It is to confuse and to destroy you. And it certainly robs you of the blessed hope. Very important. So mark this down. Is there authority behind the blessed hope that we just read in Titus 2.13? Yes, number one. The, the very one who introduced the blessed hope is Jesus Christ himself. Mark it down. Can, will you give me the license today to be um, lovingly sarcastic with you? Yes. It's part of, it'd be part of the shtick. How's that? <laughs> it'd be part of the way of you remembering what we're talking about. Number one. According to the Bible... Before this Antichrist individual is revealed, let onto the world scene, you read it a moment ago, the restrainer, the Holy Spirit, is going to step aside, and then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the brightness of his coming. You read that a moment ago. The Holy Spirit steps aside. Nowhere does the Bible say the Holy Spirit goes away. <laughs> he steps aside. We've already covered this. That event happens after the church is taken up. This is very important. Who says? Jesus. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Take a guess. Where do you think his Father's house is? Very good. Heaven. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Where did Jesus go? Heaven. And if I go, where did he go? And prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am. Where's that? There you may be also. You've got to get the church, who he's making this promise to in John 14, in heaven, to enjoy whatever he's building. I want to submit to you, if God can do what he did in six days, Jesus taken 2,000 years to build whatever he's building, on top of the fact he is a licensed contractor, <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. I want to go now. Imagine, wouldn't it be great if just a big trumpet blast and away we go, and there's people saying, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen now. Well, you know what? If you're a believer, you're going to go up anyway, and we're going to go, we told you, we told you. 
And if you're not a believer, just a religious person, you're going to say, what happened? <laughs> Why is it so easy to get out of the parking lot? <laughs> because, my friend, you've been left behind. You can park anywhere you want. So, Jesus said, I'm coming back to take you where I've been, preparing a place for you. That's a fact. And if you don't have Jesus Christ coming back before the rapture, or I should say before the tribulation, then you've got to insert him in some other place of the seven years, and you've got a problem, many problems. But you've got to stop thinking of those seven years as being somehow intermingled with the church. It's strictly Jewish. Your homework is Daniel chapter 9, verses 22 to 27. Read it, and you'll find out why the seven years has to be seven years that deal with God, Israel, and a Christ-rejecting world. Absolutely awesome. The authority of the basis of this blessed hope comes from the Apostle Paul in many places, but I'll just pick two right now. Colossians 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When Christ comes back and we are taken off, if we are that generation, when he comes, we're going to meet him in glory. Sounds like John 14, doesn't it? We'll meet him in the atmosphere. We'll hear more about that out of 1 Thessalonians soon. Galatians chapter 5, verse 5, the Bible says, For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Boy, i got to tell you, that is a theologically packed statement. Everybody listen up. For we, the believer, through the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit. This is so amazing. The Holy Spirit is the energizer. The Holy Spirit is the dynamo. The Holy Spirit is the uh, encourager for what? Every person who understands the truth of God knows this, that they're excited about meeting Jesus. You need to let that settle in right now. Are you not excited about meeting Jesus? Well, you have a problem right here with Galatians 5.5. 5. Why? Because the Spirit of God in you is energizing you, making you excited. That's how he prepares you to get ready for what? This is amazing. For the hope of righteousness. What is that? Have you, listen, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for our righteousness. You can say amen. amen. He died for all of our sins. But the moment you come to faith in Christ, remember, you give him your sin, and he gives you his righteousness. It's imparted. It's called the book of Romans. Imputed or imparted. God's grace at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Salvation at Christ's expense. You receive what God has given you. And listen, right now you and I are in the state of sanctification. Did you know that? If you died today, knowing Jesus, you'd go straight to heaven. Listen, but until he comes back, God's working on you every day. It's called sanctification. The moment you, that you either die or the rapture happens, that's when your righteousness is complete. It's all done. It's when, it's when what God has at work in you comes out of you and mission complete. So watch this. For the hope of righteousness by faith means this. We are so excited by the Holy Spirit looking for Jesus because we know this, our hope is his righteousness complete in us. And there's a moment when that's going to happen and we'll no longer ever again struggle with temptation, struggle with parking, struggle with, <laughs> and, right? Never, never again. It's complete. And you ought to get excited about that. If you're not, if you're not excited about that, you need to ask, ask the Lord why. Why aren't why am I not excited about that? Here's another good one from John himself, the Apostle John. 1 John 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be like. This is a great question, because, or a great statement. People always ask the question, am I going to be taller in heaven? You know the things that you want. Am I going to be cuter or more handsome or beautiful? Will I have long, blonde, flowing hair? Will I, will I be at my optimum weight? Will I be, you know, what will I be like in heaven? I don't have a clue. I just know this. It says that when we as his children, when he's revealed, we will be like him. Listen, 
But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope, do you? In him purifies himself even as he is pure. What does that mean? Because Christ could come back at any time. I want to make sure that I'm walking in a way that is honoring him. You know what I mean by walking, living my life in a way that's honoring him. Oh, yeah, you Christians, you know, Jesus is coming back. <laughs> hey, hey, listen. It's the fact that Jesus is coming back that makes us good citizens. Yeah. It's the fact that Jesus is coming back that keeps us walking the straight and narrow. Jesus said, narrow's the way. What's the motivator to walk narrow? That he could come back at any time, and I can't wait to meet him, and I, I want to honor him when he comes. That's normal. It's normal even in relationships. That shouldn't surprise us. So I'm going to ask you to mark down two things in your note-taking today, which I hope is a great revelation to you, beautiful revelation. There is the day of Christ, and there's the day of the Lord. Will you write those two statements down? They're both different. There are many days in the Bible. There's the day of God. There are other references to days. There's the latter days. There's the last days. There's the end of days. There's the day of the Lord, and there's the day of Christ. Listen, both of those profound events go by slightly different names, but they're simple enough to understand. You get this under your belt, Christian, and it's going to help you greatly in your Bible study. So what is the day of Christ? The day of Christ, I'm going to read this to you, is a prophetic event specifically referenced three times in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul speaks of, mark it, or take a picture of it with your phone. The day of Christ, he also refers to it as the day of Jesus Christ, and he also refers to it as the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. But notice this, Christ, Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, it's all speaking about the day of Christ. Do I have you with me? Are you still here? You don't sound like it. I have very little confidence in you. To be, to be paying attention. So, other New Testament passages allude to the day of Christ, but the use of the structure is unique to the apostles John and Paul and Jesus himself in their writings. Just make a note of that. It's very, very important. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 begins by saying this, I thank my God... Upon every remembrance of you, he's praising the Philippians. Paul loved them. Always in every prayer of mine, making requests uh, for you with all joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident in this very thing. That he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until what? The day of Jesus Christ. That's a reference to the blessed hope. Mark, write it down in your notes. That's a reference to the rapture or when you meet Christ. The blessed hope, that's the reference, the day of Jesus Christ. Just put that down. We'll keep going. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do all things without complaining and disputing. That should be over all of your children's doors <laughs> at home. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. That means you and I as believers are to be living for the word of God in everything that you and I do. Holding fast the word of life. And he goes on to say, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, as that, uh, so that I may rejoice in what? the day of Christ, when Christ raptures the church off this planet, or the dead are resurrected in that moment and joined the raptured believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, look at this word again, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you get that? 
the day of the Lord Jesus Christ or the day of Christ or the day of Jesus Christ is a good day. And you can write right on the top of it, Titus 2, verse 13, the blessed hope day, the happy day, the happy hope day, the day that I'm living for. Now, listen, for those of you who, and I know that's not you, it's people that are watching right now. You guys all get this. You guys get this. I am not saying, and I never have said, nor will I ever say, that because we believe in a pre-tribulational rapture view, because the seven years are dedicated to Israel and God's wrath on a Christ-rejecting world, that we will never go through persecution or hardships. The Bible promises you and I persecution and hardships. The church age believers, listen, the Holy Spirit came down and gave birth to the church. For the last 2,000 years, the Holy Spirit has indwelt every believer. There's only one time where that changes, and that's when the Holy Spirit in 2 Thessalonians 2 deposits the church into the hands of Christ at his coming. The day of Christ. Now watch this. Some people will say, no, 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 that verse teaches the opposite. We're going to go through the tribulation period. Well, listen. If that's true, then why isn't the church mentioned anywhere in the tribulation? If it was such a big deal, don't you think that'd be important? Why is the chapters two and three of the book of Revelation addressing the church so important? And then at chapter four, verse one, John is taken up into heaven and everything that John sees from that moment on representing the church, its vantage point is from heaven looking down on earth. And if that's not enough to convince you, all of the earth dwellers will experience all of the wrath of God. And there will be those who will be saved out of the tribulation period, but they'll have to die for their faith. Some will survive to the end when Christ returns in the second coming. But the Bible says predominantly they'll be beheaded, the believers. Today, more than ever, North Korea, China, Areas of Vietnam and areas of India, Christians and North Africa, Christians are being killed. It's, I don't know, I can't prove this. I'm just telling you what Voices of the Martyrs or organization reports. More Christians are being killed today than ever before in world history. We live in California. That seems like insane to us. Well, maybe our day's coming. But if it were to happen tomorrow, it doesn't mean Christ left us. If it were to happen tomorrow, if you and I were called to die for Jesus tomorrow, it doesn't mean that there's no rapture. Saints are being persecuted constantly. You must understand the seven years is a time of God's wrath upon the earth to a Christ-rejecting world. Seven years where he focuses on Israel based on Daniel chapter 9. Israel owes God seven years. Remember this. The joy of his coming, it should excite us. It should prepare us. So I don't know if this is going to help or not. It helps me, but I got a weird brain. So uh, have, look to the screen and we'll take a look at this graphic. Um, I'll try to fill in the gaps because I, I, I just, it's, it's just, if, uh, pr pretend we're in a theological course right now. We are actually right now, I was at Liberty University this week, so let's, let's do this. Let's pretend we're at Liberty University, we're in an eschatology course, we're studying uh, the prophetic scriptures, and this is what we're talking about. And if I were to ask the class, all right, class, tell me, when was the first coming of Jesus Christ? So I'd, I'd look for a hand, somebody would shout it out. But the only answer, there's only one answer, and the first coming of Jesus Christ was predicted by Daniel chapter 9. And that happened on April 6, 32 AD. What happened on that day? Exactly. Palm Sunday is the first coming of Jesus Christ. How do we know? According to the comings of Christ, there's only two. In each of the comings, there are certain requirements. Don't miss this, you guys. I tell you, you get this down, you'll pass the class. <laughs> if you get this down, there's no finals for you. First coming, Christ comes to Jerusalem, Israel. First coming. 
He's got to come to Jerusalem, which is in Israel. Everybody got that? How, why is that a requirement? The Bible says so. Old Testament demands it. Old Testament requires it. So how did he come? Well, the Bible says in Zechariah 9, 9 that he's going to come as Messiah riding on the back of a little donkey. Doesn't that sound cute? On Palm Sunday, did not Jesus ride into Jerusalem on the back of a little donkey? According to the Bible, his first coming, he's going to have to be heralded as king. Did they herald him as king? And they also had to shout, according to the Psalms, the Hosannas that are owed to the Messiah. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right? Did they do that? Sure did. But what happened? In association with him riding a donkey, by the way, it was prophesied in scripture that he would be the one that would be judged. He was then taken, illegally, mind you, Illegally based on Judaic law and illegally based on Roman law. He was then unjustly beaten, recorded in your Bible, and crucified. Those are the key events of his first coming. You got that? Notice, watch, the absolute essential is Christ must come to Jerusalem, Israel. Next slide. Not much of a difference, folks. The second coming of Christ, Christ must come to Jerusalem, Israel. This is what's known as the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. By the way, the Olivet Discourse, I said this last week, the Olivet Discourse has nothing. Listen, listen. In the Olivet Discourse, there is no reference to the church at all, only Israel. Don't be mistaken. I know time doesn't allow me to go deeper into this. Please leave, it, leave this on the screen. There's a passage of scripture where Jesus is warning Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. And he says regarding his coming, there's going to be, as it were, two in the field. One taken and the other one left. Two will be grinding at the mill. One taken and the other one left. Do you know that there are those who have been taught in denominationalisms that that is a reference to the rapture, and yet it's found in the Olivet Discourse. Did you know that? It is a tragedy. You want to know why? The disciples ask him, where? Where are they taken? In the Greek language, not the English, the English gives it uh, the, probably the confusion. It says, wherever the body is, there the eagle, wherever the eagle is, there the body will be gathered together, or vice versa. Where the body is, the eagle will be gathered together. That almost sounds kind of noble. Some people have said, well, the body must mean the church. The church is the body, and the eagle must refer to Christ. The only problem is, every Jew that read that in the original language, in the original Greek, Koine Greek language, it says this, where the rotting corpse are at, there the flesh, the unclean flesh-eating birds are devouring them. I heard a pastor preach that text as a sermon for a rapture argument. And I said, dude, after, I said, do you not know that that is about those being taken away to judgment at the second coming of Christ? That they're taken away to be consumed by the flesh-eating birds? And he said, yeah, I know, but I don't think people would figure that out. It sounds close enough. <laughs> no, but you say, oh, but wait, you'd be surprised people sitting around that have read that verse sloppily con uh, concluding, that must be the rapture, and look, it's at the end of the tribulation. That's a post-trib rapture verse. Sorry to disappoint, friends. That is a statement regarding Jesus judging the nations and those that are taken away are taken to be consumed in death and those who survive live into the kingdom. Remarkable. There's got, in this first and second coming, there's got to be a Jerusalem and there's got to be an Israel. For 2,000 years, there was no Jerusalem or Israel. There was Capitolina and Palestine. Did you know that? Until May 14th, 1948, something happened in the world. I mean, if God has ever set an alarm clock and it went off, 
that was the day. In one day, according to the prophet Isaiah, Israel would be born a second time in one day. And on May 14, 1948, Israel was born a second time as a nation. No longer called Palestine. And Capitolina no longer called that, but Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. Most of us take that for granted. First coming, got to be Jerusalem in Israel. Second coming, there's got to be a Jerusalem in Israel. Everybody got that? White horse, no donkey this time. Why? He's not coming to die. He's coming to reign. White horse. White horse. Look, comes as king. King of kings and lord of lords, it says, while he's on the white horse, the world will look and see him, and it's written on his thighs. Wow. By the way, his robe splattered in blood. That's a whole nother story. Oh, read Isaiah chapter 60 out to chapter 66. The Hosannas, Israel is going to say, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus said, you won't see me again. I'm leaving. You, Israel, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Remember that? Oh, he's not judged. He judges. The Bible says Jesus judges the nations. And he starts, by the way, by putting an end to the battle of Armageddon. He gathers them together in the valley of Jehoshaphat. We know it as the Kidron Valley. He judges. The Bible says when he comes back, he destroys the wicked. The Bible says that when he comes back, he slays. That's the reference I said earlier. He slays the unbelievers. They're taken away. And the Bible says both in Ezekiel and in Isaiah and in the book of Revelation, all talking about the exact same event, the birds of the air will come and eat the flesh of kings, princes, and warriors who fought against the lamb. Absolutely amazing. The, listen, the day of Christ is an awesome day. The day of Jesus is an awesome time. It's a wonderful thing. In great contrast to the day of the Lord. It's different. I fear, you guys are so quiet. I feel like, I, I feel like I've lost you guys. <laughs> but see, you're, you're, but you were in church and you're going to lie to me. You're going to say, <laughs> day of Christ, good thing. Day of the Lord, terrifying. Are you ready? Listen, here we go. The day of the Lord. <laughs> Bringing with the rapture of the church, or beginning with the rapture of the church, the day of Christ, only then can the day of the Lord begin. A time of God's wrath and judgment to be poured out upon a hostile, rebellious, Christ-rejecting world. The day of the Lord is a period of time that follows after the rapture, and it is carried out through the seven years of the tribulation period and continues on out until the end of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on earth. Maybe this is a good way to remember it. The day of Christ you and I are waiting for. Watch. Imagine an Olympic field, the 440 or the 400 meter. How about that? Where you see some of the fastest humans on earth, the 400 meter you know how those guys get in the blocks, right? Imagine right now you and I are living in a time where we're getting in the blocks. It's that kind of the state. The people are in the crowds are there. Everything's gathered together. And now I don't want the, I don't think, they, I don't know if he's called a referee or what, but you know the guy that's got the starting gun? That guy's got the gun, and when he thinks it's the right time, he fires that gun, right? We've all seen this happen. I want you to watch this. Day of Christ, day of Christ, day of Christ. The guy's got the gun. The guy shoots the gun. The day of Christ, the bullet, as it were, goes up. Think of this. The moment that goes off, the day of Christ is, the rapture goes up, and at that moment, the day of the Lord begins. The race is on. Did you get that? The day of Christ begins the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord can't start until the Antichrist is revealed. The day of the Lord can't start until the Holy Spirit steps aside. When does that happen? When the day of Christ happens. The moment the day of Christ happens, it's a twinkling of an eye. It's a trumpet blast. It's a shout upward. And then when the church is up, on with the race. 
The day of the Lord begins and it goes out, as I said, for seven years plus 1,000 years, the Bible says. Remarkable, awesome. The day of the Lord. Listen to this. Malachi. And you think about the context, Malachi. Malachi 4, 5. This is Malachi. It's not, he's not a, he's going to mention Elijah here in a moment. This is important. Elijah. You want to put yourself in the, in the uh, tribulation? Let me tell you something right now. If you're going to do that, then that's not Malachi talking to you. It's Malachi, some Italian guy. <laughs> Malachi's a Hebrew, he's a Jew. And he's telling them about the day of the Lord. Who is he talking to? Jews. What's he saying? Behold, I will send you Elijah. There is no promise that God is going to send Elijah to Gentiles. There is a promise that God will send Elijah to the Jews. Listen, for Jesus to be Messiah in the second coming, Elijah must come first. Did you know that? Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Wow. Joel chapter 1 verse 15. Joel 1 15. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Does that sound like a blessed hope to you? Isaiah 13 6. Wail for the day of the Lord is at hand. It, sh it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Amos 5, 9, uh, 518. Amos 518. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. Woo! Obadiah 115. For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. Notice it's all nations. The world. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. Most scholars believe that's the judgment of God upon the nations that mistreated Israel during the seven years. Wow. Joel chapter 2, verse 27. Then you shall know that I am the Lord in the midst of... Where? Israel. I am the Lord, your God, and there is no other... My people, that's the Jew, shall never be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Listen, you're gonna, I'm going to read something to you in a moment. And you're going to think that it's the book of Acts. And you're going to think that uh, it's, it's a, something that should be going down, happening at a church down the street. I want you to pay close attention. When the gospel came first, it came to what people? Mm -hmm. In what nation? Mm-hmm. They rejected the message. Where did the gospel go? <laughs> to all of the... Exactly. When God picks up his focus on Israel, he's going to pick up where he left off. Do you remember when Peter said, don't you guys know these people aren't drunk, as you suppose? But they're speaking all these languages, giving God praise and glory and honor, because this is what Joel spoke about. Remember that? Book of Acts. This is where God's going to pick up. When the rapture happens, God focuses on Israel. And this is what he's going to do. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. That's a reference to the tribulation period. Why? The earth is going through that and God is working with Israel again. Make sense? Man, I hope so. Verse 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Wow, the day of the Lord absolutely a time of great danger, great peril, great judgment. The Bible says regarding the day of the Lord that those who do not believe God will both curse God and yet they won't believe in him. They will curse him and they're going to try to find a place to hide from his wrath. 
They're going to cry out and they're going to say, the Bible says, rocks and hills fall on us. They would rather commit suicide than bow their knee in repentance to Jesus because this is what they say. Rocks and hills fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. That's the day of the Lord. You and I are called to be living for Christ now actively winning as many men and women and boys and girls to the love of God and the forgiveness of Christ as is possible. And when God is done with the church, out we go, and there he focuses on Israel that owes him seven years. It's crystal clear. I'm out of time. No, I can't. I'm going to go. I'm going to hang on. <laughs> hang on. Isaiah 63. Guys, guys in the control tower, get ready. Uh, Isaiah 63, watch the continuity of this. Isaiah 63, written 743 years before Jesus was born. So we're looking at a prophecy that is 2,700 years old. Isaiah 63, woe, or, or who? Who is this who comes from Edom? Edom is east of Jerusalem, by the way. With dyed garments from Basra. Basra is down toward Kuwait. This one who is glorious in his apparel traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads, the, tre treads in the wine press? I have trodden the wine press alone and from the peoples or nations, no one was with me for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. That's, that means I am going to punish all wickedness on the earth, and oh, by the way, I'm coming back to rescue my Israel. Remember the context. This is Isaiah talking about the redeemed believing Israel. Verse 5. I looked, but there was no one to help. This is the Messiah speaking. And I wondered that, uh, that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. Absolutely powerful. Next one, guys, should be Revelation. Watch this. John says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of the great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice. Give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. That's another name of the church. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, not robes, fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. By the way, that's not you. You're not invited to your own wedding. There is no wedding without you. No wife-to-be is invited to her wedding. Did you get that? Okay. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Oh, sounds like Isaiah, huh? His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, and the armies in heaven. Really? Wow clothed in fine linen. There's an army in heaven clothed with a wedding gown? Yeah, we just read about her a moment ago. She's quite a gal. <laughs> she's got a wedding gown on, but she's got weaponry on. And um, white, verse 15, oh, well, the word of God, verse 14, and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron, and he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's the seven-year tribulation period. 
the time of Jacob's wrath. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. That's Megiddo, Harmageddon. Then the beast was captured. You know this Antichrist guy we've been talking about? He's going to get arrested. And with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, miracles in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, 666, and those who worshiped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of burning, or a fire burning with brimstone. That's... (laughs) Revelation, Isaiah, this is the day of the Lord, people. The only participation you have in the day of the Lord is that you're following Jesus coming down into the events of this earth that have been a Christ-rejecting world. God focuses on Israel. And my challenge to you today is if we're starting to see an economic digitized currency, the dollar is drying up. There's wars and rumors of wars as we sit here this morning. The bizarre, strange, demonic compulsion to reject the divine plan of God in him making male and female. You guys, this is a demonic time. Be ready. Know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead. You can't reform yourself. You can't say, I'm just, okay, pastor, boy, I, I, I don't want to be involved in the day of the Lord. I want to be ready for the day of Christ. So give me seven steps. What's the 12-step program? There, there's only a one-step program, and it's fall on your face. It's the fall on your face program, where you fall on your face, and you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Lord, wash away my sins. You died on the cross for me. You rose again from the dead. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. That's how you get ready. There's no other way to get ready. That's how you prepare yourself. Church, let's stand together. Father God, we pray. Lord, I pray. I pray you'd come today. If there's anything in our lives that would make that an embarrassing moment, purge it from us. Lord, we know this. The Spirit of God dwells within us. We've been sealed unto the day of redemption. And so, Lord, if there's anyone in this gathering or those that might be watching right now and they're thinking, "Uh, uh, that's scary to think that Jesus could come back today. My friend, it should be your blessed hope. Why is it scaring you? It's because the Holy Spirit is saying to you, you're not ready. You're doing something. He's telling you about it right now. He's telling you, drop that thing. Get away from her. Get away from him. Get away from it. Come to me. In fact, go to him, and he'll give you the power to get away from that stuff. But by all means, dear friends, get ready. My goodness, oh Lord God in heaven, reveal to us any wicked thing that would interfere our walk with you, our life with you. And for any man, woman, boy or girl right now that might be saying, I I need Christ, then you tell him right now, friend, wherever you're at, here in the sanctuary or around the world, you say, Lord Jesus, come into my life and save me from my sins. I believe you died on the cross for me. You rose again from the dead. I can't save myself. I come to you just as I am. Imagine if the last person on earth is about ready to pray that, and up we go. That's why why I kind of waited a minute. It's like, how about now? How about now? Until you do come, Jesus, may we burn for you. 
you're awesome. Thank you, Lord, that you have delivered us from the wrath to come. In Christ Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys.